the red button. Yes. So good afternoon and welcome to our third meeting of the Social Science Webinar Series. Uh, today we are very pleased to have with us Rachel Franklin, who will talk of a very interesting topic, special inequality in the smart, in the smart city. A special welcome to Rachel. Uh, thanks for being here and for being always available to contribute to GSSI activities. Uh, Rachel is a friend of the GSSI, we could say. Uh, she has contributed to our activities in many occasions during the past years. Uh, she taught GIS and uh, spatial analysis within our PhD program, but also within a summer school we, we organized at the GSSI. She was the keynote speaker for the internal and international migration workshop we held at the GSSI last January. Uh, she is also a member of the scientific committee of our doctoral program and a member of the external faculty board of the GSSI Social Sciences. Uh, so let me briefly introduce Rachel. She is a full professor of geographical analysis at Kurtz Center for Urban and Regional Development Studies at Newcastle University. Uh, before moving to Europe, Rachel was based in the US at Brown University, where for eight years she was the Associate Director of the Special Structures in the Social Sciences Initiative. She is currently the Editor-in-Chief of the journal Geographical Analysis and a member of the editorial boards of many other journals. Uh, her primary research focus is in special demography and the interplay between special analytics and demographic change uh, her focus is in particular on quantifying uh, patterns, sources and impacts of special inequality, which is the topic of today's lecture. Uh, smart city technologies, in fact, hold the promise of increased efficiency and productivity and also the promise of improvement of the health, well-being and quality of life of urban inhabitants. But this promise is also paired with the risk that these te technologies could benefit only uh, some groups more than others, so generating new inequalities and reinforcing existing ones. So before leaving the floor to our guests, let me outline the structure and organization of our uh, webinar. Um, first of all, as usual, the presentation will be in English. Uh, the webinar is split into two part, parts. Uh, first, we will listen to Rachel's talk for about one hour. Uh, then we will have uh, a five minute. And when we, we will come back, there will be the questions and answers session for about another hour. Uh, how can you ask questions? You have to use the meet chat on the right side of the screen to ask me to have the floor to make a question. Um, please keep all the questions for the second part of the webinar. Uh, also, people following us on YouTube can make questions. And speaking of this, um, I would like to thank in advance Ugo Rossi from GSSI, who will collect uh, the questions coming from YouTube for me. Uh, two things, uh, very important, two very important things before leaving the floor to Rachel. Uh, first of all, I kindly ask you to switch off your microphones and also your cameras in order to avoid disturbances uh, during the presentation. And finally, uh, especially for those who are attending the Google Meet session, I must inform you for privacy reasons that the webinar is recorded. So if you have issues with that, uh, I kindly ask you to move to YouTube. That's all, I think. So Rachel, the floor is. Thank you very much. Let me. OK, so now. I can't see anyone in the webinar. I see only my slides. So someone will have to tell me if there is a problem. And this is the very first time that I do such a webinar. 
even though they're not becoming very frequent. Um, another difficulty is that I cannot tell uh, when people are sleeping or bored because I can't see any faces. So I will do my best to keep this moving and to make it interesting. And if there's some area where I didn't cover enough information, then please do bring that up in the questions. So um, as Julia said, I plan to speak for about an hour. And I plan to introduce a new project, relatively new project, um, that has to do with sensor networks in the smart city. And so what I'll do for the next hour or so is talk a little bit about what we mean by inequality. I'll then introduce Newcastle upon Tyne, which is our case study, and talk a little bit about the preliminary analysis we've done for Newcastle. I'll provide some comparisons to Newcastle just to give a sense of how um, typical Newcastle might be in this sort of larger smart city context. And then I'll close with some um, observations about future directions in the project, um, but also sort of unanswered questions that I think remain to be tackled. And so um, before getting started, I'd like to introduce my team. So I'm the PI on this project, um, but much of the heavy lifting, in particular, all of the very nice visualizations in this talk were done by Kate Robinson, who's the postdoctoral research associate on this project and who soon moves to Liverpool University for a lectureship. We're also supported by two research software engineers, one at the Turing Institute in London and one here at Newcastle University, David Herbert and Jack Roberts. They haven't contributed so much to um, the preliminary analysis that I'm going to present today, but they will be key for the, the future steps that we take. Okay. So most talks that, um, that introduce smart cities and technology like to highlight the fact that uh, we live in an era of data, that most of the information around us has been created just in the last two years. And often if you talk to engineers or computer scientists, what they highlight is the difficulty in managing this information, cleaning it, streaming it, uh, analyzing it. Um, but I'd like to pick up on a slightly different aspect of it, which is that you know some of this data is accidental exhaust data, but a lot of it is bespoke. A lot of it is, for example, from sensors that are placed in cities or CCTVs, where there's a deliberate purpose to collect information. And so what we'd like to highlight here um, with this talk and with the project is that there's some deliberation involved in deciding what kinds of information we should collect and where we should collect it and for whose benefit. Uh, we're working in partnership with the Urban Observatory and I'll talk a little bit more about them as I get into the Newcastle case study, but they're the largest set of publicly information data for the UK. They have a very um, broad and deep um, network of data that streams real-time information. Um, but it's very much the case of learning how to distill policy relevant conclusions from that information. And much of our focus is on the outputs. What do we do with the information what we've, once we've produced it? But on the other side of that is thinking about what sorts of information should we be collecting and where. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about inequality, which I think is a term that we use in different disciplines differently, but we also understand, uh, I think, individually um, in different ways. One way of thinking about inequality is as structural. That is that we all operate within larger structures that privilege um, some groups over others, some places over others. Um, we could think about inequality in terms of income, those who are more well-to-do, those who are poor, background, which could be ethnicity or religion, gender, certainly. And increasingly, we talk about digital inequality. That is, who has access and is able to make use of um, new technologies that are coming online. Right. So one example, this is from the Opportunity Insights Project at Harvard, um, and is a way of thinking about structural inequality that we may not always um, think about. But this is a graph that shows the percent of children who earned more than their parents by birth year. And so what you see is sort of a clear downward trend. Um, and this reflects to a large extent, this is for the United States, um, to a large extent that these myths in the US of social mobility and economic mobility don't necessarily hold true, that a lot depends on who your parents were and what your parents did. And that even holding that constant, so to speak, um, younger people are worse off in terms of that mobility that we used to see 
um, than older generations would be. And I don't show you this um, really so much to talk about the graph because I'm not going to talk about income inequality or social mobility, but to highlight that in order to produce this information is very much a question of big data. So when we think about big data, we often think about Twitter or Facebook or these sort of sensor networks or remotely sensed information, but a lot of it is just um, tax return data, for example, here, where you have to be able to match the parents when they file their income taxes with the children over time in order to be able to see how the children are performing relatively to their parents. So, so the key takeaway from this slide is partly that inequality is, is structural, but also that in order to answer questions about how inequality operates requires um, a lot of analysis and a lot of good data and a lot of clever thinking. And I, I, this is an aside here. Um, but another thing to think about is that it depends, a lot depends on your parents and a lot also in the case of the United States depends on what neighborhood you happen to grow up in. So for some very nice maps and data analysis, you could check out the website and they have a very nice interactive map that sort of allows you to take a look at this at a very fine neighborhood scale for the United States. We also understand inequality to be spatial. That is, if it's structural and there are certain structures that hold people in their place, and this is governed by different characteristics, we know that these characteristics are not observed equally across space, that it's uneven. And this means that inequality can largely be thought of as a spatial phenomenon, right? So here, just to give a couple of examples, this is England. So you're missing at the top of the map, Scotland, and you're missing Wales on the side, if this looks like a strange piece of geography to you, for small areas. And this map is showing the percent of the population for whom their day-to-day -day activities are limited. And a, the really key takeaway here is just that there's there's a lot of blue on the map and there's a lot of red on the map. It's clustered and it's in different locations. So there are some people who are, some places rather, that are very, very, very healthy and some places that are relatively unhealthy. And you can imagine that if you put the space and the structures together, that it could be difficult for some people in some of these places to ever climb out of the circumstances in which they're placed. Closer to home, this is a, a map that shows Newcastle and Gateshead, which is the city just across the River Tyne from us. And this is a map of sort of digital inclusion or inequality. And here, just to just sort of highlight to you, what you're seeing on the map for every neighborhood, every sort of street and neighborhood is a color where the purple colors represent those who are offline or withdrawn and so we can, and you can compare that then to the to the red and the orange which we would we would see as cultural creators or professionals or e-veterans and here is just to highlight that uh, even in terms of adoption and comfort with digital technologies we we see spatial inequality on the map is observable and it's observable at very fine scales and so you could imagine that, of course, this matters when engaging with local public services. It matters for, for finding a job online. It matters for knowing when the next bus or tram or metro is going to come for you. Um, but it's also going to matter when we talk about smart city technologies and sort of understanding how these technologies are implemented across space. We can also think of inequality as a process. And this is a little bit more um, uh, maybe unintuitive or complicated to think about. Um, but what we mean by this is that inequalities are reinforced simply in our decision to decide what is important. That is, if you are a city government, a local government, or a funding agency with a finite amount of money to spend, how do you decide that what you should spend it on is CCTV cameras or sensor networks and not bike lanes or schools or public health, for example, and that these decisions that we make when we route the funding in one direction rather than another, that that can be thought of as process inequality because it's going to privilege some people over others. Some groups of people are going to want bike lanes more than other groups of people. And with finite resources, every time we divert those resources, we're going to privilege some over others. So this includes deciding who is going to fund which priorities. How do we even decide what our priorities are for local areas, for cities or regions? Allocating the scarce resources and the extent to which individuals uh, help with the decision making, how policies are developed, who accesses information about the decision making, and also, especially in the case of big data, smart city technologies, especially having seen that map for Newcastle, where you can see that there are some groups that are completely divorced from, from the internet. Um, 
what does it mean to provide streamed data for all to use from sensor networks, for example, or from censuses or surveys, when some will have more capacity to, to engage with that information than others? It's not simply the case that you can download the information. You have to be able to work with the information, interpret the information, um, and have some level of comfort with it. There's also inequality that's inherent to technolog technological change, right? So when we talk about smart cities and we talk about those who will be excluded, this isn't a new story. This is something that happened with cars. It's something that happened with cell phones, with televisions, radios. Pretty much every technological leap has been accompanied with discussion and recognition that some groups are more easily able to engage with these changes than others. Right? And there's a, there's a great deal of research, especially in geography, on um, smart cities and technology. So Michael Batty has noted that new technologies, regardless of their origin, have a tendency to polarize and divide. This is going to operate at multiple spatial scales. So you could imagine um, global north and global south cities, for example, stretching away from each other, urban areas and rural areas stretching away from each other. But as Shelton and all have pointed out, cities themselves are also internally differentiated. And so a lot of what I'll show you over the next several minutes is that we think of Newcastle as an entity as a certain kind of city. But of course, once we look inside the city, we realize that, that it's very diverse economically, socially. Um, and so when we talk about smart city technologies that are going to be allocated across space, some groups will be more exposed to those or will benefit more to those technologies than others, potentially, that is without um, without careful thought, right? So this idea that smart cities privilege some places, some people, and some activities over others, right? Um, and of course, in geography and computer science, uh, larger social sciences, there's been a lot of discussion, which most of you will probably be aware of, of this idea that algorithms have implicit bias, that data, of course, also has implicit bias. The decision what information to collect necessarily determines that some information can't or should not be collected. So some places, some people, some concepts simply don't have information to represent them. So now I'll talk a little bit about sensors in the city. So um, starting with sort of the larger area, Newcastle upon Tyne is one local authority within the larger Tyne and Weir region. It's a little bit difficult to make it out, I think, with the labels, but it's this region here. Hopefully you can see my cursor. So this is Newcastle upon Tyne, the larger city region surrounded by these other local authorities. Newcastle upon Tyne or Newcastle um, is in the northeast of England, very close to Scotland on the eastern coast, and it's composed of 175 lower super output areas. These are basically neighborhood scale with a, a thousand or so uh, inhabitants. So these are the units of geography that we'll be working with um, for the Newcastle case study. The Urban Observatory, which has the sensor network that we make use of, is a very large national investment, over two million pounds. Um, to construct these urban observatories throughout the, the United Kingdom. This is the largest and the original. It has building scale observations, so sensors within rooms, corridors, um, but it also has the UK's densest air quality monitoring network. And so that's the piece that we're going to be use, using. Um, there's an interactive map and a website that you can go to. If you just Google urban observatory, you'll be able to see the locations and types of different sensors. So there's everything from air quality to weather to cameras that, that track um, traffic, but also beehive activity and water quality and noise. Um, so a very wide array of sensors. Oh, and I should, just, I should just say that a really interesting question, of course, with all of this information is that if, this, if these data are, if these data streams are in real time, right, and constant, it's like a fire hose of information. So it is a really important question to talk about how to make use of all of that information and derive policy relevant or science relevant conclusions from the data. That, however, is not what this um, project is interested in, is how the decision gets made about where to place the sensors in the first place. OK, so we have 196 air quality sensors across Tyne and Weir. 144 of which are located inside Newcastle upon Tyne. All right, so what I'm going to show you for the Newcastle case study is very much sort of an exploratory analysis, just looking at connections between where sensors are located and the kinds of people who live in those areas.
So here you can see for Newcastle upon Tyne with no sort of demographic socioeconomic characteristics of any neighborhoods, just the sensor locations. And I think it's probably pretty clear from this slide that um, sensors tend to be clustered. This cluster that you're observing down in the bottom of the city is the city center, right? So this, was, this would be where we would observe a lot of movement, both in terms of buses, cars, public transport, but also people uh, with a corridor of sensors that stretches up through this part of the city, a few more sensors in other neighborhoods, but really I think the, the main conclusion we would draw from this map is that much of the city is not covered by an air quality sensor, regardless of what our understanding would be of um, the extent of coverage for an individual sensor. So what we're really interested in here with this project is where are sensors placed and to what extent do we observe deserts or cold spots, areas that are not covered in the city? And when we observe these cold spots, who is it who happens to live in them? Because I think an, from an inequality perspective, an argument could be made that if areas that are covered by sensors are the same on most dimensions as areas that are, if they are and they aren't, and they're the same, then um, it's maybe, um, an inefficient or silly placement of sensors, but it's not a question of inequality, if that makes sense. However, if some people are more likely to be able to check their air quality than others, then that's an inequality question. And this is, I think, different from, although similar to sort of an environmental justice question, what we're, where what we're interested in is, um, do some groups tend to be located in closer proximity to poorer air quality, right, to, to hazards? Um, our argument would be that without careful placement of sensors, that's a question that cannot be answered because you're only observing air quality for the places where you did in fact place the sensors. Okay, so if we look at the neighborhoods, like we see, we can see that the bulk of Newcastle indeed is not covered by a sensor. So these would simply be neighborhoods that have at least one sensor within them. And this is because many neighborhoods have more than one sensor um, while the majority have none. Okay, so what we're going to do is look at uh, sensor placement and assess it against age and health, so vulnerability, but also what we refer to as sort of injustice, which would be relative deprivation. Are these places, you know, these poorer neighborhoods that, that do or do not have sensors? And then thinking about exposure, because one piece that um, I won't talk about today is the fact that uh, individuals, of course, are not static. They're moving throughout space. So you could have sensor locations that are fixed, but individuals are not fixed at their homes, right? They're moving through space throughout the day. And so the question would be, what sorts of people are more likely to come in contact with a sensor throughout the day? So one way that we'll take a look at this uh, for today's talk is by looking at sensors that are placed at schools. Okay, so this is, again, the share of the population for whom day-to-day -day activities are limited. Again, the blue would be uh, healthier neighborhoods um, and the red would be less healthy neighborhoods. Um, and you can see that for Newcastle, there's a clear geography to this. Some neighborhoods are very healthy according to this variable, whereas some have um, between a quarter and a half of their population uh, for whom day-to-day -day activities are limited, right? So the question is, um, are these people covered, right? So if they're vulnerable populations um, who are maybe in terms of asthma, for example, um, for whom air quality might matter, are we able to measure, in fact, their air quality in their neighborhoods? And what we see is that no, actually, um, if we look at health and sensor coverage, that it's actually the healthier neighborhoods, right? So about half of the healthier neighborhoods have a sensor, whereas it's a very small share, 10% of the least healthy um, neighborhoods that have a sensor. And this is something we can talk about more in the questions if you want. So almost half of the neighborhoods uh, with the best health in England have an air quality sensor, and less than 10% of the least healthy neighborhoods in England, in Newcastle, um, have a sensor. So this is a big difference. Um, here I have just a couple of maps that sort of compare age um, distribution and sensor locations. You can see this is a map that shows the population um, below 10 years. Um, you can see that for Center City, there aren't so many children, um, nor are there children so much on the far periphery of the city, but in the sort of inner bands of 
you might think sort of older suburbs um, is where most of the children live, but where few of the sensors are located. So if you wanted to be able to say something about the youngest children in the city and their local air quality, you wouldn't really be able to do so um, from the current array of sensors in Newcastle. A similar picture emerges for older people. This map shows the population 75 and up. The distribution of population is slightly different with more older people on the closest band to city center and on the, in the furthest bands. But again, uh, older people and sensors don't seem to be so co-located, right? Except for this little stretch right here, perhaps, right? With a couple of exceptions. Next, um, we'll take a look at sensor location and relative deprivation. And to do this, we use the index of multiple deprivation, which is very frequently used in England. It's produced by the Department for Communities and Local Government. We use the 2015 edition. Um, it breaks neighborhoods into deciles um, from the least deprived to the most deprived using the same color scheme that we've used for previous maps. And it compares relative deprivation for almost 33,000 small areas across England. It's not without its critiques, right? It's sort of a, it's a, a bundle of attributes that are considered to be related to deprivation, right? So income, housing, crime, health, um, but it's, it's very frequently used by local policymakers. So if we look at Newcastle upon Tyne, you see that almost a third of the neighborhoods are in the highest or most deprived neighborhoods. Um, but we do have a good number of neighborhoods that are fairly well to do, right? So about a fifth of the neighborhoods are in the 10% most deprived nationally. Um, but over 60% are in the 50% most deprived um, nationally. And this is typical for um, Newcastle or cities of the north, which have a sort of industrial heritage. Industry has left and they've struggled since. So we're not unusual in Newcastle. This is what the geography would look like. This was very similar to what we've seen in previous maps, for example, even with the internet. So along the river, we have more deprived neighborhoods, the most deprived neighborhoods. And then we have a pocket of very well-to-do because this is the 10% relative to all of England. So this isn't just the best, the best of the best in Newcastle. This is some of the most, um, some of the most wealthy areas in all of England. Okay, if we then look at sensor coverage, um, this is for Tiny Weir, you see that um, by far, um, the, the better off neighborhoods are more likely to have a sensor. And if we talk to the engineers about this who decide where to place the sensors, for them it's a very intuitive process because sensors are expensive and you have to find a place to put them. And so their arguments are that um, they're opportunistic in choosing where to place the sensors and they would like the sensor to be protected and not have rocks thrown at them, not be destroyed, not be stolen. And so for them, the sort of understanding of, of where to place sensors in terms of local neighborhood characteristics is completely different from the way a social scientist might look at it, right? Whereas from a sort of demographic or, um, I don't know, sociological perspective, um, there's a great deal of inequality in the amount of investment that goes into placing sensors, especially something that's supposed to capture air quality for individuals and saying that actually if you live in the poor, the poor neighbors, which are already deprived, which already face so many other um, risks and disadvantages, that you're also much less likely to be represented in these networks. Right? And in fact, this, sort of, this spider diagram sort of shows that if you live in the in the less deprived neighborhoods, you're much closer on average than if you live in uh, one of the more deprived neighborhoods. Here we show the five most deprived neighborhoods in Newcastle, none of which has a sensor, and all of which possess a major road. That is to say, if you were to maybe make an argument that was pairing hazards with vulnerability, we would say, well, these neighborhoods probably have both. They have the potential hazards in terms of large roads that produce air pollution, but they also have deprived populations um, for whom air quality might be very important. So there is there is sort of some inherent inequality to the way the current network is structured for Newcastle. And then very quickly, I'll just show you a couple of slides for schools. This is a result of a new project. So this was just getting going as a partnership between Healthy Schools Newcastle, Newcastle City Council, and then um, 
a part of the urban observatory called Sense My Street, which actually has sensors which are not fixed. So uh, neighborhoods can request to have a sensor placed in their area. And the urban observatory will, will help the neighborhood get organized to do this. So Sense My Street um, uh, entered into a partnership with schools. All right. And so here, the hollow circles are schools with a sensor. According to this new program, the red circles would be all of the schools in the local authority. So most schools don't have a sensor. And again, sensors are expensive. Um, on the other hand, there's a very nice argument for putting sensors at schools. One is that this is where children are during the day. So if we're worried about how air quality is affecting their health, then tracking them at schools might be smarter than tracking them at home when they're indoors. Another advantage of the sensors at schools is that they offer the opportunity for citizen science. That is, children can take part in learning how to manage and engage with the data that's being produced by their sensor, right? Um, so with this sort of preliminary results with the number of schools that have sensors, about a quarter of children at primary schools have an air quality sensor. Um, but this is because the project is just getting going. It's slightly less if you take all of the young people in Newcastle. All right. And you can see here from the map um, with deprivation and the schools that have sensors that it's a little bit more equitable than the regular sensor network, which was much more likely to privilege better off neighborhoods. So you still have a number of probably better off schools which have sensors, but at least you have some of these neighborhoods down along the river um, whose schools now have sensors. Um, so we would say the school coverage is probably slightly better than the than the regular um, air quality sensor network. There are some differences in terms of the kind of school. So we don't have a lot of data about the individual schools, but the schools, the primary schools that have a sensor are more likely to be excellent schools. And there's a strong correlation between sort of school quality and the kinds of kids that attend schools. Um, but it's, as I said, not as stark of a difference as it was at the neighborhood scale. And this, I think, reflects a little bit of process inequality. So how do these, how do these um, initiatives work, right? And Newcastle is not unusual. In many cities where you have um, an initiative where you would like to encourage schools to have sensors, it's a question of schools opting in. They have to get in touch and say, yes, please, we would really like to have a sensor. And to be able to do that, you have to have the capacity in terms of teachers and school leadership to be able to um, both ask for, request the sensor, but also monitor it, take care of it, um, use it in school lessons. And so it's not so surprising that the more middle class well-to-do uh, primary schools would be more likely to request this free technology compared to schools that may have um, other problems that they're coping with. Okay, so just going back a little bit to this sensor placement quandary, right? Newcastle um, is by far not the only city thinking about these um, smart city technologies and in particular air quality um, sensor networks. So um, whether cities are talking about sensor networks or whether they've already deployed them, there's a very common um, facet of smart city technology. This is a project called Breathe London, which had 100 sensors that were to be distributed across London. And I show you this only to highlight that there are different processes at work for where sensors are placed, right? And this is what we really care about. We care about the decision um, to place a sensor in a particular location and the inequalities in coverage that may emerge, right? And so they had an explicit policy to, to have um, a sensor in each of the 32 London boroughs, right? These are large, right? And sensor the, actually, the, the coverage area for an individual sensor isn't all that great, but at least there's, a, there's an explicit policy to have even coverage across the entire city, and there's a priority placed on sensitive locations, including schools and medical facilities. So you could think about if you were a city with limited resources and a limited number of sensors, how would you think about placing those sensors so that you would maximize coverage, for example, of vulnerable populations, or even coverage throughout the city. Uh, and so I think already I can say that one conclusion from our preliminary work has been that it's it, there's, of course, a great deal of exciting work to be done on analyzing the data that come out of sensor networks. But really, there's, I think, a, a nice gap that exists in helping cities understand the importance of 
process in deciding where to place the sensors in the first place. Probably the smart city uh, technology that most of you will have heard of is the Array of Things project in Chicago. Um, this is funded by Argonne and I think University of Chicago. Um, but again, they've placed 100 nodes already um, with another 100 nodes that were supposed to be placed last year. Um, but again, what I'm showing you here is the decision about where sensors were to be placed. And what they note on their website is that node locations are chosen with input from researchers, from neighborhood groups, city departments, and community members. So if, if one goal of, of sort of smart city policy and technology is to build inclusion, there's inclusion in terms of coverage, but there's also inclusion in terms of discussion about process, right? And when we talk to the engineers, again, about where sensors are placed, they're much less concerned about where the sensors are located in the city because their argument is that you can model the air quality ex post facto. So once you're collecting the data about air quality, it's easy to measure or estimate air quality for all locations in the city. Um, but of course, that means that some people don't see a sensor in their neighborhood, whereas other people know that they're being measured. Right? They know that they're represented by their local government or local projects, right? which means that they matter. They have a strong, visible material signal that they matter. Um, but it's also an issue, of course, that even the very best air quality model has uncertainty attached to it. And that uncertainty is going to be associated with distance from sensor. So um, it's really important to think about where the sensors are placed. So for Chicago, this is the distribution of the sensors on the right. Um, and what we have on the left is median household income. Uh, and again, Chicago, not unlike any other large city, certainly in um, the UK or the US, has a great deal of diversity in terms of income and socioeconomic status. So we have in blue, very well-to-do neighborhoods, very close to um, neighborhoods that have lower median household income, but also lower household, household median income for a long time for generations. So we show you income here, but we could show you race and ethnicity, for example, and a very similar segregated picture would emerge. Just from a sort of visual assessment, you can see that the sensors are much more widely distributed across the city of Chicago than what we observed um, for Newcastle. And in fact, um, when we look at the figure, we see that yes, indeed, some of the, you know, there's, you're slightly more likely to have a sensor if you're in the richest neighborhoods in Chicago, but that it's much more evenly distributed across all of the deciles uh, for the city, right? Certainly performs better than Newcastle. Okay, so back to the placement quandary again, right? So how do we think about what it means to be a sensor desert? And I sort of touched on this a minute or two ago, that there are different ways of about thinking of the purpose of a sensor, right? So for example, when we talk to the engineers, they would differentiate sensor network purpose um, in terms of hazards, right? So thinking about where hazards, nuisances, those sources of pollution are located and wanting to place the sensors there, right? So there, if you were thinking about what it means to be a sensor desert, you would say, well, if you have places where you have known hazards and you haven't placed a sensor there, then you're almost sort of knowingly, willingly um, not producing knowledge for those polluted locations, right? And the engineers are very much interested in sort of where the, where the hazards are produced. From sort of demographic or geographic perspective, I'm more interested in where the people are located, right? So you could think about this as being sort of, sort of more vulnerability oriented, right? And here you would think about placing your sensors um, where vulnerable populations are located. And in that case, a, a sensor desert would be places where populations are not covered by a sensor, right? There are other ways of thinking about this though. One um, that I touched on just a moment ago is that some of this is political, right? Some of this is the visibility of the sensors in your neighborhood. When you walk down the sidewalk, do you see that your city cares about you and wants to measure your air quality or do you not see this? Right, and so what you see for Newcastle is, in fact, some of the, the wealthiest neighborhoods in Newcastle have multiple air quality sensors. They also, coincidentally, have some of the worst air quality, which is an unusual situation for a city to be in. So there's, there's a reason why there are lots of sensors, but it's also that those individuals know how to advocate for themselves. And when decisions are being made, 
about where to place resources, you can be guaranteed that some neighborhoods will be much more vocal than others. So there's the political aspect, I think, of placing sensors in all types of neighborhoods so that the people who live in those neighborhoods know that they count, right? And so under that, under that sort of definition of a desert, then you would say neighborhoods or wards that don't have sensors are deserts. Then there's sort of the more evidence-based ways of thinking about measuring sensor deserts, right? Sensors are producing information. So anywhere where you haven't placed a sensor is potentially a desert, right? It's an area where you don't have coverage. And if you have vulnerable people living in those deserts, then it becomes, I think, a very important spatial inequality issue. Um, there's even, you know, even in terms of the air quality modeling, if you, I would argue that if you live in an area with high levels of uncertainty, then you also live in a sensor desert, right? Okay, so just to start wrapping it up, so thinking about ways forward and takeaways, um, cities don't thrive by data alone. So one way of thinking about this is that it's not sufficient to simply produce streams of data, that um, this needs to be one component of a larger process that both engages individuals, but also thinks about how to use the data on the other end. What kinds of information do we want to collect, right? For whom and where? It's also important to think about transparency in terms of what is measured and where. Air quality was chosen for our case study because everyone cares about air quality. Um, but in other cities, if you, if you follow discourse around, for example, um, capturing the sound of gunshots, right, or noise, that these are, these are measures which, inquire, which require funding, which are expensive, but which clearly don't apply to all people in all places in a city, right? Um, many of the models, both for air quality and noise, um, require validation. And so in many of these cities, um, the sensors have been placed. Um, they produce a, a, a range of data, some of which is more accurate um, and so there's always this need for validation. And this is validation in terms of um, areas of uncertainty where you don't have where you don't have sensors placed, but also where you're getting high or low readings for air quality uh, and placing secondary sensors in those places. And I think it's more of a more than a question of simply top down cities deciding where to put the sensors or allowing people to choose where they would like their sensors because of this issue that some groups are going to be more vocal and more willing to advocate for their areas than others. So there, there needs to be some sort of combination process to ensure that, that everyone is included, right? So obviously here, when I'm thinking about inequality, I'm thinking about inclusiveness of, as well. Um, and then as I just touched on this idea of coverage and what it means to be covered is complicated and will mean different things to different people. Um, and if you're the policymaker, if you are a city, for example, with again, a limited budget that is feeling the pressure to um, become a smart city, to spend money on sensors, uh, how do you decide what the purpose of the sensors is going to be, right? And having a clear, transparent conversation about why you want sensors. Is it for branding? Is it for city marketing? In that case, um, it's true. No one will ever go and look at where the sensors are placed in the city. What they care about is what's on your website and how many sensors you have, right? If it is actually about um, covering vulnerable populations, then the extra work needs to be done to place the sensors in those places where those populations are. Um, and then finally, and this is where we are right now with the project and why we have software engineers on it, is the need for decision support tools. Right? So this, because this is multidimensional, because it's complicated, um, it's not straightforward to make these decisions. And so what we're working on right now are tools that assist uh, local decision makers to decide how to balance the trade-offs between numbers of sensors and where to place them so that you can think about, for example, maximizing coverage of children or elderly populations um, or maximizing coverage of, of hazards. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you, Rachel. Very interesting topic. Um, I think we, sh we should go for a coffee break, five minutes and then we will meet here so uh, 10 to 5 to 4 okay
Okay, we are back. Thank you, Rachel, for your fantastic talk. So now, the questions and answers session. Um, so for now, I see uh, thanks to Rachel. Uh, <laughs> very nice presentation. So if there are uh, any questions for Rachel, please ask me for the floor on the chat. Or Ugo, I wait for you to transfer me all the questions coming from YouTube. Okay, I will do. Thank you. Alessandra says she has a question on the chat. <laughs> yes. Julia, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, hi, Rachel. Very nice talk. Uh, it's very interesting because we are facing a similar problem in the city of L'Aquila. In fact, we have this Center for Urban Inform Information and Modeling, the Q QIM, we call it, um, which is an interdisciplinary project with the physicists, the mathematicians, and computer science, and us, as social science. And we are planning to, guess what, put sensors <laughs> all around the city of L'Aquila. There have been a big talk about uh, L'Aquila Smart City and so on. And one of the things that they asked us is, okay, can you identify as social scientists some locations, some spots where we can start putting the sensors? And it was such a complex uh, question that we were taking a little bit by surprise. We really didn't know what to answer immediately. So, you know, I might ask you for a consultancy when the time comes to actually tell them where to place the sensors. Um, okay. Um, lots of very interesting maps, and um, there was one in which you were mentioning these uh, um, population with limited, well, these areas with limited activities, and it was the map where you had uh, health and disability. I was just wondering if you could tell me a little bit more of what it means, limited activities, and what kind of uh, index of, you know, health and disability there was. So... This, hold on, I'm just going to pull my slides up on a different computer so that I can see them. Um, it is a, it's an um, Office of National Statistics variable. So you ask people whether they're limited in their activities. So it's um, self-identified. Okay. So you don't know whether, what limited means, if it's physical, if I, it's um, mental, if it's... Uh... I think it can be... Um, well, I assume that it's mostly physical, but it can be, I think, blindness and deafness and actual physical limited mobility. But I would have to check that. Those are good questions. Yeah. I, I, you know, I'm always uh, into this disability problem. So I, I yeah. was just wondering what, what kind of, if it was just physical or if it was also mental disabilities, yeah. you know, learning or whatever. Well, if you look at the sort of the, the similarities between the maps for the index of multiple deprivation, and um, this health variable, you see that there are a lot of similarities, right? So that in many cases, it's entire neighborhoods that are more disadvantaged. And they're dis and when, once they're disadvantaged, they tend to be disadvantaged in lots of ways. This is something that we know, right? Sorry, I like other people talk, but isn't that surprising? Because the index of multiple deprivation, I'm thinking about things that in a sense can also be controlled, such as income, for instance, you can fix that. While uh, I'm, I'm thinking about like with the COVID, right? A disability is random, should affect in a sense both rich and poor people, no? It's not, but disabil disability is not random. Um, in the same sense that some people are more likely to get sick than others. So a discussion in the UK has been about, for example, bus drivers, but of course also nurses, but people who are more likely to die. And of course, we, because of sort of sorting into different types of occupations, you're going, this is, this is structural inequality, right? It's these pathways that, that determine that certain kinds of people from particular neighborhoods, from certain backgrounds, will be more likely to be placed in situations that are riskier. They're also more likely to be placed in areas where um, 
air quality, for example, isn't as good. So there's been a lot of discussion about COVID and sort of vulnerability to getting sick in the first place, right? So it's very difficult. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So now, Rachel, we have a question from Ugo Rossi. Ugo, please. Yes. <clears throat> Thanks, Rachel, uh, for your uh, fantastic talk. Um, I'm really, it's really fascinating account of the smart city, which is also quite unusual, I would say, in the literature, which is mainly qualitative, uh, at least in human geography. So it's a kind of a very innovative uh, perspective. I have a very basic question. In, uh, from your perspective, from your research, you think that uh, uh, this kind of uh, smart city policies, processes, uh, are creating uh, new inequalities social spatial inequalities or are expanding and uh, deepening uh, uh, existing inequalities at, at both uh, income levels and uh, also uh, uh, neighborhood levels and um, okay thank you i think it depends whether um you're looking well my short answer would be i think it probably deepens existing inequalities mm -hmm. um but I think it also depends if you differentiate between the the sensors themselves. So, and I'm when I talk about smart cities, I'm very much interested in these networks because the networks are placed across cities. So it's a geographical problem. Where do you place a sensor, right? But it's where you place the sensors. But it's also what do you do with the information that's produced from the sensors. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think in both ways you risk reinforcing inequalities that exist. There's the spatial inequality piece where you tend not to place sensors in certain locations and you might oversample in other locations. Um, but then there's also the question sort of what would we like to collect information about in a city? Uh, beehives, uh, and you know, I'm, I shouldn't make the joke about the urban observatory because they're, they're funded from a funding agency. So it's not that the local city decided to invest in a sensor for bees. But you could make the argument that um, money is very scarce. So maybe there are more important things that you should be collecting data for. And maybe um, it's a question of, of talking more to city inhabitants about if you were going to measure, what would you measure? And this is, I should say, a very different question than the one about surveillance, which is the one we usually have in smart city discussion, which is a lot of people don't want to be surveilled. They don't want to be watched. And why is it that we always want to watch some of the same groups of people and not others, if that makes sense? Why are some people entitled to privacy in their neighborhoods and others not? Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. I have a question for you. Ah. Um, so, what's uh, people's perception on this uh, issue? I mean, uh, are they aware of this unevenness, first of all? And if they are, do they complain? Do they ask for more sensors in the areas or not? So, most of the requests for more coverage, speaking for Newcastle, have tended to come from more well-to-do neighborhoods. Because you have to know to call someone or email someone, and you have to feel comfortable doing that. Um, I don't think that the average person probably thinks a lot about these sensor networks. They do where noise or gunshots are concerned. Um, and then I think there are questions about the unevenness of enforcement, right? Because that's what it is, paying more attention to some areas than others. Um, but I, I have not seen any discussion at the very beginning phases where you ask the question, is this what we should spend our money on? Or should we spend our money on schools? Right. Okay, thank you. Now we have questions coming from the chat. Uh, we have a question by Abir Alaham. But if you are on the meet, the meet room, you can ask the question yourself. not a question. Uh, hello. Yes, yes. Yeah, um, I just have a question. Thank you, Rachel, for the nice presentation. Nice talk. Very, very interesting. I have a question about the concept of the smart cities per se. That now, uh, you know, 
people or researchers are divided between some who advocate the concept of smart cities and those who are against the smart city as a whole. It kind of intensify the concept of inequality, which you started talking uh, about. So, uh, for example, in India now they're starting to do uh, 100 cities, whereas most of the people, they don't have access to clean water and uh, sanitation. So, uh, going with the smart cities will, in, in a way, enhance uh, the concept of inequality and more power for government uh, centralization, which you mentioned as capital uh, capitalism surveillance. So, uh, what is your opinion about that, please? I agree with you. I think that I think that that is the example that I was giving of sort of of schools versus sensors. In many cases, especially in um, in European or North American cities, um, these sensor networks so far have been funded either privately or through government grants. So they're research projects, and this is a way that we. I think have circumvented some of the discussion about whether local governments should be spending money on sensor networks, especially in times of austerity. And I think your example of India is a, is a good one, right? It is the question that you there there is not so much money to go around, uh, and what would be the most important um, places to spend those limited funds? Um, I also think, and here I'm not an expert on this, but I. I think it's also a question of deciding what we want to measure and then deciding how to measure it and that sensors are a very particular narrow way to measure many of these things that we care about. Um, and I think it's partly because they're visible, right, that cities can put them on their websites, they can use it for marketing, it brands them as a particular kind of city which may hopefully drive external investment. Um, but if clean air is what you care about, I mean, we we probably have other ways of measuring air pollution, and we certainly know where lots of the sources and hazards tend to be. So perhaps uh, it would be better to direct resources towards mitigation, for example. So I think I, I'm a little bit skeptical of smart cities, but I also think that um, for the time being, they seem to be something that cities really want to be known to do. And so if cities are going to do this, if cities will feel the pressure to especially have air quality um, sensor networks to deploy those throughout the city. How do you help uh, local policymakers and city officials to make these decisions when this isn't what they're trained to do? They're not trained to yeah. pick the best locations for sensors. They don't have time for this or training. Often cities don't have the internal resources to analyze this information. Um, so. I think as researchers, we can be helpful in um, helping to guide the discourse and guide discussion about how this should be done, right? Best practices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, of this, all of my problem is that how to use technology in the best way for the people themselves, not for the government and the new, new liberals. So it's, it's a dilemma. You cannot. I don't know. There is no no solution yet for for that uh, dilemma, maybe. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now a question from Sara Karamaski, who is a postdoc here at the GSSI on future research avenues. Sara, since you are on the meet chat, would you like to elaborate more on on that and ask yourself the question to Rachel? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Rachel, and thank you for your presentation. Really interesting. And I have a question. It's more like, say, a general curiosity about uh, the links between uh, city branding and city marketing and smart cities. So the question is, which topics do you think uh, research should address in the near future? Uh, let's say trying to analyze how smart cities and city branding and urban sustainability, but also community involvement um uh, should be addressed by research uh, and by scholars not only from the social science computer science and other uh, fields because as you said in your presentation at least in your conclusions city branding and city marketing are somehow well related to um the uh the inequalities that the smart city um, might create. So my question is more about a uh, curiosity about which 
kind of topics the research sh should address? Well, I'm not sure that this would be an, an answer to your question, but I have the sense that at this stage of understanding smart cities, especially from more of a quantitative standpoint, you know, when we look at other aspects of cities, for example, local economic development, um, or why people choose to move to particular cities, we now have the models and to a large extent, the underlying data that we need to compare cities. It, this is a different problem when we talk about smart cities and that we're not even agreed on what a smart city is, what the different types of technologies would be, who's paying for those technologies. Is it cities or is it private companies that are paying for them? Or is it funding agencies? Um, and then what sorts of data are they producing? So that um, in our case, when we started looking at Newcastle, you know, one of the first questions that we had was, well, what's everyone else doing, right? Because a, there's no one source of data that you can go to and download a table of every sensor everywhere in the world and then compare it to the local neighborhood characteristics of every city. So to me, this is interesting in that we're still at the stage, I think for this kind of research where you need the, the cross comparisons across cities because there's a lot of idiosyncratic information about cities. No one is doing it in the same way, right? So in, in a lot of cities, it's privately produced. In fact, I think just last week in Toronto, Google announced that they were pulling out, um, and I didn't read the newspaper article, so maybe somebody here on the, on the seminar knows more about this, but this was a big deal because the city of Toronto had basically offered to Google the chance to sort of privately invest and develop these sensor networks in a piece of the city. So it wasn't even that the city had ownership over this, it was that a private company did. And often these sensors are owned by private companies that come in and offer the technology. So you have questions about ownership of data, ownership of sensors, and it really varies from city to city. So I think with to go back to the sort of city branding and marketing, there's I think a lot of interesting work that could be done that mixes the quantitative and the qualitative research mm -hmm. to understand what's happening in particular cities, what's happening in Chicago. I mean, I think one thing that makes Chicago a little bit more evenly distributed in terms of sensors is that um, University of Chicago is on the south side in a predominantly black neighborhood, right, that these so that instead of having the seat of power and money be located in a wealthy white neighborhood, um, you should have externally encouraged, I think, to place sensors in lots of different locations. So, Thank you. I, I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, it was a very general question. Mine, right <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it does seem to me that it's a it's partly a branding question. Everyone wants to be known as a well, let me rephrase. No one wants to be known as a dumb city. I mean, that's not something that you would ever put on your website, right? So, um, so much of this is about that kind of hype. I think it's a good um, sort of regional economics question, whether that hype has a payoff and how, how that relationship works, right? I mean, do you already have to be in a strong position economically to attract those sorts of sensors and the kinds of people who want sensors? And then that contributes to further economic growth I don't know. I mean, I think that that's an open question. Thank you. Now a question from YouTube. Francesco Lelli asks a question about readiness of governments. Are policymakers ready to handle the new paradigms that smart cities require? Um, probably not. I mean, most of us have engaged with our cities. If those of us who live in cities, we've engaged with them and we know anyway, I don't know any exception if anyone is living in a rich city with lots of resources right now and lots of individuals who can answer every question and fix things for you. That's not, that is not the paradigm that we live under. So if you think about adding capacity, analytical capacity, another responsibility for cities. I mean, from an engineering standpoint, smart cities are built as increasing efficiency. Right? So private corporations come in and say, if you have traffic sensors or sensors for when the bins are full and they need to be emptied or for um, air pollution, you can save money, right? I mean, uh, the argument that's made um, by the private providers of sensors is that this will actually save you money in the long run. Um, and again, I haven't actually seen a quantitative assessment that says, yes, 
yes, it can save money and in improve well-being for all inhabitants in this way. But I think that that is a gap that exists. A question from Bianca Biaggi on uh, um, the privacy issues. Bianca, would you like to make the question yourself? Are you there? No, she only wrote on the chat. The question yes, of the is. privacy is very interesting. I just see yes in the chat, Bianca. <laughs> <laughs> would, you, would you like to tell something about it or? Well, um, I think we live in a time with all data, whether it's smart city or otherwise generated where we're, um, I don't think that anyone has worked out what the trade-offs are in terms of privacy and surveillance. I mean, I think right now the times that we're living in with COVID and the discussion about government apps, right? That if we can develop apps for our phones for everywhere we go, then maybe this is a way to permit more freedoms. And are, is that, are we prepared to have conversations about once those technologies exist, what else they can be used for? Because once you know whether or not I've come in contact with you, whether it's for illness or for anything else, that's pretty powerful. And um, yeah, I think that it's a, I think that in all cases, this is a pretty big deal, but we've, we have largely made decisions that we're willing to give up a lot of our privacy, Facebook, Facebook, Twitter. There's Bianca. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. No, no, this was the question because for me, uh, there is a good thing and a bad thing related to the, the private um, issue. I mean, using this kind of inform smart city yeah. um, issue. I mean, uh, it, it is a good thing, but also it's a bad thing if you look up uh, the private, the private uh, side, I mean, the privacy side. Yeah. So that was my, my point. So uh, uh, this is, is a point that is not enough uh, to me uh, up to now developed and under, understood the, the consequences of, of that. No. And in our fields, um, we haven't talked so much about what it would mean when we talk about inequality and we talk about local inequality, but inequalities in terms of surveillance is not something that in regional science or studies or economics that we talk so much about. Um, but I think that it's, it's important because there are some ways that we might be more, product, more protected in providing more information, but other people don't gain the same benefits. And in the case of city, these sensor networks, I think the arg one argument is that they are measuring air quality and not any sort of local individual attribute. But in terms of noise, that's more problematic. Noise, I think, actually is a really good one because it's, it's culturally determined how tolerant you are of noise, right? It's not that everyone has the same beliefs about how loud your neighborhood should be and what sorts of noise are, per, are permissible. Exactly. So it's hard to measure noise in a neighborhood, I think, um, the technology may be agnostic, right? The technology may not be biased, but the ways in which the technology are used are, um, are implemented. That's, that, is, that is biased because we have a belief that some people shouldn't be loud on Sundays in their back gardens, but we think we should be able to put fireworks off for holidays when we want. Uh, all of them produce noise, if that makes sense that the sensor itself isn't a problem, but what we, what we believe about noise is problematic. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Margarita has a question for you, right? Yes. Thank you very much, Rachel, for this uh, fascinating talk. Actually, you partly addressed uh, what I was going to ask uh, while answering uh, to Bianca, because I was actually thinking about uh, two aspects related to uh, specialized inequalities that emerged uh, throughout this COVID-19 crisis uh, regarding especially 
homeschooling uh, and uh, uh, healthcare uh, issues. So I was wondering if you had the chance to uh, develop uh, uh, some reflections about it or make some uh, uh, observations because uh, uh, if, uh, let's say, on the healthcare side, uh, the um, implication of the technologies uh, seem to relate more to uh, privacy aspects even though there is an issue of access to the technology how you can use it how you use your devices right with the homeschooling issues this thing is even more uh, visible uh, because of the fact that many kids may not have at home the devices to follow uh, homeschooling and this was something very debated in italy so i was wondering if you've had any chance to uh, debate uh, um, to think about these uh, things uh, uh, in this period. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I think uh, in this case, I am with everyone else that I am experiencing this from day to day. And because I'm a social scientist, I'm very curious to see uh, what the consequences will be. I mean, I think, for example, so this is not related to smart cities, uh, it's about technology a little bit. Um, but I, I, it's, it's a piece of conversation that I think illustrates how difficult these conversations are. Um, in the US, the discussions around opening universities in the fall and whether they should be in person or whether they should somehow be online. Um, you know, the initial discussion has been um, that it's not safe for students who are less healthy or for professors who are less healthy, right? That this, it increases the risk. Um, for those who are more vulnerable if you open the university back up. On the other hand, if students stay home, you make a lot of assumptions about what resources those students have at home. You assume that they have internet. You assume they have their own bedroom where they can study. You assume they have their own laptop that they can use. And of course, it won't, it's, it's, it's unequal how this plays out because some people are more likely to not have these things than others. And of course, this plays out geographically. There are some parts of the US where you would be less likely to have good internet service, right? Or to have a bedroom to yourself, um, or to come from a family where learning would be um, prioritized. So I think there isn't an answer. I, so my answer is this, is this is very complicated because no matter what, someone, someone is likely to lose. Um, and so it's, it's an uncomfortable conversation about you know, how do we how do we make these trade offs such that hopefully not any one group is too much disadvantaged? Thank you, Rachel. Still lots of questions for, for you now, Carlo. Caporali. Yes, thank you, Giulia. Thank you, Rachel. It has been a real pleasure. And yeah, my, my my point is also related to the to the privacy question, but probably more uh, to the side of um, the surveillance. So I would like to ask you if uh, have you ever experienced uh, something like that? Uh, I mean, if, if if we if we could uh, could say or could imagine that the lower income neighborhood, speaking about the urban environment, are less willing, let's say, to have the big brother watching them in terms of uh, uh, sensors, controls, uh, in terms of video surveillance or stuff like that, uh, in comparison with the higher uh, income uh, neighborhood, of course. Thank you very much. Um, well, I, <coughs> I would guess that if that is the case, that um, it's not surprising I mean, this is, you know, then we go back to these ideas of structural inequality. If you know that the people who should be representing you in your city have consistently over time um, not treated you well, that you've never been on the right side of any bargain, why would you suddenly um, have trust in the people who are meant to be your leaders? And here it's a multidisciplinary quandary question, right? I mean, it, there's, there's, you could argue the sort of engineering and computer science aspect of what we measure and how we measure it. But there's also the, the political component, the policy component of how you get into how you encourage individuals to trust um, each other and trust uh, their leaders. 
And then there's, there is the privacy piece, right? Once you encourage people that, you know, if you tell them that there is a sensor and it's for their own good, how do you ensure that it actually really is for their own good? And in some ways, these questions are not new, right? Uh, we have this every time we have a census or ask someone to complete a survey, right? There's a certain trust in institutions that has to exist that you believe if you tell someone how much money you make or what your religion is or uh, whether you live with another woman or another man, uh, you have to believe that the people you give this information to are not going to misuse it, right? And I think, unfortunately, in many parts of the world, probably every part of the world, there are some groups who consistently have had the experience that their information either isn't trusted or the correct kinds of information aren't being collected. Um, I would be really curious for more disadvantaged neighborhoods um, what they would like to see money spent on. If sensor networks were to be deployed, what would they like to see measured? I imagine that air quality would be high up for many of them, but maybe they wouldn't care about noise. Um, so it's about conversation. And I think that takes lots of different disciplinary perspectives to learn how to create the conversation, uh, how to ask the right questions and how then how to use those results um, advantageously or productively, I guess I should say. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much. Now we have Wilber who wrote down on the chat that he, he has a question for you. Wilber, are you there? Yes, hello, thank you. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. good, uh, thank you. Uh, so I had the pleasure of doing my PhD in geography at Newcastle, ah. uh, but it must have been before you, you uh, joined the department, Rachel. Um, it was really fascinating to, to see your uh, detailed analysis of the data of the urban observ observatory and i'm particularly interested in your finding about the areas with more young and old people um leading to more centers for example being installed at schools and i was wondering can you expand a bit more on the the older age side and maybe how we how can we better include uh older people in smart city technology um, so that's so two interesting points about your question. So the first um, about older age and say air quality is just the assumption that um, vulnerability to poor air quality is not evenly distributed across ages, right? So young children tend to be more vulnerable and older people tend to be more vulnerable um, to poor air quality. So that would be something that you perhaps would want to measure. Um, I think this is a similar response to the previous question. I think it would be really interesting to know if we were going to measure elements of the built environment, what would be most helpful for elderly populations? And I think a lot has to do with ability to be active in your local space, right? So it has to do with crossing streets, for example, um, safely and knowing that you won't get hit by a car. And, oh, there is a very good example, actually. It is that for children and for older people, you know, in most countries, when you hit that button to cross, it's much too short. Whoever that was made for is not either one of those groups. I don't think it's even made for me. I'm never across the street in time. So it's these little things about asking people in their neighborhoods, what would they like to measure? And then I think thinking creatively about what could we measure, especially about the built environment, that would improve quality of life for elderly populations on the assumption that what we want is to maximize uh, ability to maximize mobility, basically allow people to get out still so that they don't have to stay home and they don't have to drive. Yeah, I think it's in, in aging societies, this is really important. And yet this has not been something that we have talked that much about when we talk about smart cities. And this is why I think that is sometimes a branding more of a branding question or engineers have been in charge, but that actually from a demographic or I don't know, social science perspective, what you would want would be to understand what can these technologies do to improve quality of life for different demographic groups. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Rachel. Now we have, um, we have Ilya who asked, for the floor to make your question. Ilya? Uh, yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great, um, thank you, thank you, Rachel. 
for your fantastic talk. So I actually have three quick, two, two quick questions. I'll try to be quick. Um, so the first one is, um, through which processes and negotiations the, the data that are collected uh, through census uh, are taken into account into urban policies or shape somehow inform urban policies if they do. So what is the, the chain of communication and of discussion and of decision that connects uh, the data gathered and urban policies or politics? And the second question is, um, again, about the relation between um, smart technologies and inequality, I think that maybe another way to look at the problem is um, not on the side of not only on the side of sensors but also on the side of analytics and algorithms and so my question is uh, particularly about the data sets and how they are cleaned reprocessed and um, prepared for for algorithms to be able to work on them or work through them and we know that to this Reprocessing, a lot of information are often lost, a lot of information are often left out deliberately or automatically. So, what, what are your thoughts on that? And if you think there are some good practices to make data sets you know, more democratic or at least um, less biased or less uh, limited? Thank you. So, to take that question first, I think it's very difficult to make data sets completely unbiased. So I think the more important thing is to understand where the gaps exist and what the implications of those gaps are, right? Because just to take surveys, for example, where you ask people questions, often we think about um, the bias that's introduced in terms of response. Who did we ask the questions to? Who did we not ask? Um, are there ways that the questions are asked that give us answers that um, introduce bias? But there's bias at the front end in terms of what kinds of questions we ask in the first place, right? So in the case of data produced from smart cities or even Twitter, for example, so even sort of digital exhaust, um, even if you're following any of the discussion about COVID and testing, not to bring this back to COVID always, but if you follow this and you realize it's really complicated, over the last month and a half, we've learned so much about, uh, you know, that it matters who is tested and who is not tested, right, and where. Um, but, let, so, but let me say something about the smart city data, and that is that um, the way most of these systems work when they talk about democratic provision of data is that um, you can download the data or you can use the API to basically claim the data for yourselves. Where the problem then exists is that most people don't have the capacity to store that amount of information or clean it, and that is all on the user. So where I think, um, where I think a lot of potential exists on the um, data-driven engineering or computer science side is to develop tools that automate a lot of that cleaning of the data for the user so that they don't have to know how to do those things. So tools that help guide users to know what, what to query in the data and how, and, and what the implications are if they make those queries in that particular way, if that makes sense. So for example, the Urban Observatory has a straightforward interface where you choose which variables and which dates, and then you just get very messy data because the sensors, um, don't always produce uh, very good data. So then you have to know something about when a sensor is not calibrated correctly, for example. So it's even if even even presenting the data on the website doesn't doesn't solve those problems. Your first question um, about chain of command, I think this varies from city to city. Because for example, in the case of the urban observatory, it's a funded research project at the university that works in collaboration with the city, but it is not the city that is in charge of it. So then you have uh, indirect ways of communicating information. Um, and I think every city must have some variation of that. And I don't think that, 
I could be wrong. This is not my area of expertise. I don't think that many cities have reached the point of using the data productively that come from these sensor networks. I think they're still, they're, they're, they're at the point of, we're at the stage where we produce a lot of data. We're not at the stage where we know what to do with it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Rachel. Now a question from YouTube. Mm -hmm. Olga asks you, uh, which kind of methods are used for validation in areas of uncertainty? And also, do you double cross sensor data with other types of data? So yes, so I don't do this, but the engineers who run the project, that is what they, that is what is, that's what is typically done. So periodically the fixed sensors have to be calibrated. Um, and then in areas where you don't have sensors, you, you provide mobile sensors, but those also have to be calibrated. So there's this, for the same true but unknown level of, of some element of air pollution, the sensor is going to read something around that, right? So you have to know how to link all the sensors to, to get a sort of the best estimate of what you think the, the readings are for a particular place. And that is, that's what is done. Okay, thank you. Now we have Paula, uh, who thank you very much for this interesting presentation. It was really inspire, inspiring. And then she would like to ask you if you look at the distribution of transport networks, big firms, in relation with the location of sensors. So we're working right now on um, trying to estimate the has the sources of pollution for the city. Um, and there are not very well, there are not very good. You have to estimate the air pollution. Sorry, uh, I'm looking for a way. So, so basically, you use the traffic to estimate the air pollution, um, and even that requires some guesswork because there just there are not um, super good sources of traffic data, particularly not in real time. Um, so, what we do is look at major intersections and sort of historical um, government. You know when. The, basically historical data on on traffic loads for the city and then use that to sort of approximate where we think the sources are for pollution um but most of the sort of real-time traffic data is proprietary right so that's also tricky i'm not sure that that actually answered the question yes i think i think so rachel <laughs> uh, now we have three questions um about covid so oh. I, will, I will collect them. Okay. Uh, so we have Dhruv Ponya, who asks, are government ready to handle the new paradigms that smart cities require after COVID-19 impact on the whole world, um, especially COVID-19 more spreading in smart cities? Uh, do you want me to... Go, you can go on. To go on with the sure. other questions sure. so you can sure. and then i'll see yeah okay um what is your vision uh, of the impacts of covid19 in possible urban futures regarding smart cities and inequalities and then is it going to expand the smart solutionism or there will be a, a parag paradigm shift towards an alternative smart city also related to covid emergency I don't know what will happen. I what I do think is that just as we have seen sort of dis, spatially disproportionate impacts of COVID, I think that the the exit, the the socioeconomic impacts of the exit of what happens after will also be spatially disproportionate. And some areas, you know, if you think about the problem as one of say social distancing and um continued austerity so redistribution of limited resources then when you put those two things together then of course some people in places will be more resilient will be better positioned to handle a new paradigm than others right so for example neighborhoods which were um 
all neighborhoods with large proportions of people who can work at home a and in particular industries that have been you know resistant to higher unemployment levels they do better right um, those people in places that are dependent on public transport um, I think that that's so the unknown, the reason I'm hesitating here is that I think um, some of this conversation has also been around what happens afterwards in terms of climate change as well, right? And so this hope that if we had to make big changes now because of COVID, that that would then nudge us towards making the necessary changes related to the climate. But anyway, in the UK, for example, our new guidelines suggest that you drive where possible because it's safer, right? It maximizes the social distance, which runs completely contrary to the recommendations that we would have where climate change is concerned. So I'm not very optimistic. I mean, I think there always are winners and losers, and those winners and losers are all, always um, spatially concentrated, right? Um, and I think we can probably predict some of the areas and places that will do better. Um, the unknown, I think, is sort of what happens, like in the United States, where they just take off all of the rules. Then I think that's sort of like the natural experiment to me, because we don't actually know how much social distancing matters. We don't know how much wearing a mask matters. We don't, we don't have numbers to go with these things. So there are experiment over there, and it could be that none of that matters, and then we just go back to usual or it's a disaster and then we all stay home for the next year. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. I think we can share your reflections. <laughs> <laughs> and now we have a question from YouTube, Daniele. Premise, in some geographic literature, smart city is also conceived as a smart land, a portion of space wider than administrative city. So the question, do you think that the censored policy or administrative or branding and marketing issues somehow could replace and also and also territorial rationale of smart cities? I don't know. I mean, this is a hypothesis of mine around the branding. I could be completely wrong. Uh, and also, I've been thinking about smart cities in terms of sensor networks, but that, of course, is only one small piece of this larger idea of, of smart cities. But smart, I mean, the thing about the sensor networks is that they are grounded in space, mm -hmm. right? They have to be placed somewhere. Other policies that are more about, um, I'm trying to think of an example. Well, Probably even 5G is the same because you have still the mast posts for where it is. But it would be the idea would be that it would be ubiquitous and uniform across urban space, right? Everyone has access to 5G at the same time. That's different from the sensor networks where you're either close to a sensor or you're not, right? And so to me, this, the sensors are very interesting because they cannot be ubiquitous. Um, they necessarily have to be selective about where they're located, which... I think lends itself to reinforcing spatial inequality. Thank you, Rachel. Now we have lots of questions. Uh, what about Fabio asks, uh, what about blockchain techs as an antidote to centralization? I don't know. Uh, but I've, but it seems to be the decentralization question seems to be a big one, especially where apps are concerned for uh, for the smartphones, right? Um, it's uh, probably a little bit of a trade off between whether you trust your government or you trust the technology companies. So I think one concern is that yes it's difficult to trust your government, but it's their job to be trustworthy. It's not the job of a corporation to be trustworthy. And so placing our data with Google or Apple or Facebook is potentially problematic because we could regulate it, but in essence, that is their business. The business model is to acquire information. Um, 
and maybe we'll see a lot of change in the coming decades. Um, but it certainly seems that the, de the decentralization of information that would be collected with any phone app is much smarter than putting it in the hands of central governments. Um, and there's been some there's been some research on uh, in the U.S. with the the census where they collect data every ten years. Um, this question of differential privacy and the fact that even with smartphones alone, the argument is you could never identify someone all by themselves. The problem is that it's not difficult at all with very few data sources to put those data together and then uniquely identify someone, right? And so it's not the, the unique data source that's necessarily problematic. Although I think in the case of phones, because it's got location and attributes, that's, that's problematic. But in many other data sources, it's that we now have the capacity to integrate all of these different data. And then you know lots about people, right? You know who they're with, you know where they spent their money, you know where they've been all day, you know what they do for work. Um, yeah, so putting, I think regulation is required. But I'm, I'm not the only person who believes that. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Okay, now we have um, comments. Um, Gina? Uh, wrote that uh, the point you made about more disadvantage, disadvantage and their priorities um, was crucial. Um, yeah, but there's no a proper question on that. Um, instead, we have a question from Valeria. Are you there, Valeria? No, she's not yeah. there. So I, yeah, yes. here I am. Would you? Would you like to make the question yourself? Uh, yes, thank you. And thank you indeed for the for the talk that is really inspiring. And um, uh, I've read that the EU uh, financed the project, uh, the Smart Rural 21st, so to, uh, to, to, to turn actually also rural areas into smart rural areas in the 21st century. And they promote these... Um, activities uh, to support interventions uh, uh, with guidance and technical support so what what do you uh, what do you think that could be the main issues and challenges when we try to apply this concept of uh, smart uh, centers as uh, smart uh, cities into a rural area also because in these um, past few weeks uh, there were there was this uh, uh, debate on uh, how rural areas uh, could be much more uh, livable and attractive uh, compared to cities in the month or in the year to come. And so, what what's according to you the uh, best way to apply this to a village or to a rural area? Thanks. Thank you. I mean, in many in many ways, um, smart rural areas is easier to engage with productively than smart cities in the sense that we know that ICT provision is really important. We know that it allows people to be connected, economically active, um, facilitate access to services. Uh, we also know that um, thinking about transportation, for example, that basically there are, there are these areas where we know we could use technology to improve quality of life for those who already live in rural areas and those who might want to shift there um, in the coming years. Um, where difficulties exist probably is um, that not all rural areas are the same and not all rural inhabitants are the same. Many of them want different things. Right. And, and it depends on your geography. In some rural areas, what people really want is to be connected to the closest big city. Right. So what they want is physical access to city. In more remote rural areas, it's not a question of, of longer distance mobility. It's more a question of maintaining connections and access to services, provision of services. Um, I would be curious to know um, how you engage with local communities to ascertain what they want before you go in and provide it to them. I mean, ICT, broadband, those are obvious. 
but I think there are probably other areas like trans public transport that are trickier because you have to ask people where they want to go and why and when, and then sort out the best way to to provide that service at a, you know in an affordable way. So I think I find rural areas more interesting than the cities in some ways. Thank you, Rachel. I think the questions are finished. <laughs> so thank you a lot for your insightful talk. You raised a great interest um, and the number of questions were testament of that. <laughs> thank you again for being with us as usual, very available. And now before leaving, I want to, I want to remind you about our next meeting. Uh, it will be, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so our next meeting with our webinar, Social Sciences webinar series will be on Thursday, the 14th of May, same time. So from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m., uh, 5 p.m., sorry. Um, we will have Valeria Costantini from Università Roma 3, uh, who will talk on climate change and armed conflicts in Africa, persistence and propagation over time and space. Thank you all for being with us and see you next time. Thank bye. you very much for having me. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Bye, Rachel. Thank you very much. Thank bye, you. Rachel. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Great talk, thank you. Rachel, are you there? Thank you from yes. Nigeria. Can I? Yes. Can I from Nigeria? Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Rachel, can you can you stay just a second? Um.